Thank you. All right. So, okay, good. All right. So this. Oh, okay. Danger. Dangerous. All right. There's a lot of booby traps here. Okay. So, uh, so this session is actually a hands-on workshop. You're gonna get your hands wet and dirty, and you know, see how do we actually uh, plan and and design. Uh, levels and and create missions, you know, so all that is, is going to be in here uh, So let me just tell you how this will go. Okay, so you know you get you know what to expect So first is that I'm gonna just briefly tell you a little bit of you know um, the, uh, the the theory part okay, and then so you I'm sure a lot of you probably already knew it But just to set the context so in case people who don't know it, okay, and then we're gonna uh, ask you to kind of in your group you all have paper and um, I presumably all of you have some writing utensil, right? Writing equipment, <laughs> pen or something, right? So, yeah, so th there's also markers on the table, okay? So the markers are, are for later. So f when I ask you guys to, to start working, you're going to get a time. The time is going to count down on the screen. You're going to work on the problem that I tell you to do, okay? And then um, when the time's up, I'm going to actually generate a random number, which will be between one, between one to seven. And then so um, actually, why don't you guys call off the number? Just table one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. How's that? Okay? So, yeah, so one, two, right? Wait, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay? All right, so I'm going to generate a number from one to seven, and then the group that where the random number is generated is going to come up. You have two minutes to tell me the solution that you come up with for the problem. Okay, does that sound good? You guys, you guys ready for that? Okay. All right. So let's let's see how this works. Okay. So basically, you know, um, when I was asked to give this workshop, you know, by Pete, you know, he asked me, oh, we want some workshop at gamification. I asked him like, you want a one day workshop or a two day workshop? <laughs> and he's like, you got one and a half hour. Okay. So I said like. Initially, I was saying, I have these 10 tenets. You know, this is actually perfect for learning from failure. You know, this is actually my observation of the failures in the industry that's codified into 10 different tenets of successful gamification. So I thought initially, maybe I could just say, like, OK, some tenets of <laughs> successful <laughs> gamification, right? And now that's, that's still not going to do it. OK, I'm, that's going to actually still it's gonna take probably three, four hours. So instead, we're going to do this. OK, so we're going <laughs> to, yeah. So I'm, I actually pick out some some important tenets, okay? But it's going to be kind of uh, the theory part will be kind of shortened and and concise, very concise. So hopefully, and I'm going to talk pretty fast, okay? So <laughs> slow me down if you can't understand, okay? So anyway, so this is um, basically what I will talk about. What I'm going to begin with. So basically, the the notion of gamification is really applied behavior economics, okay? What does what does that mean? That means you usually this design process, right? And then you implement it, right? If you're designing a software or an app or something, right? And then you basically roll it out onto the cloud and everything. And then, and then you basically try to get your user to behave in, in a certain way, right? But then you say, wait, 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 that's kind of strange because I can't program a user, right? I can't, I cannot like program a user to do a certain thing, right? They're not like a, a, a machine that I could program, right? But the interesting thing about gamification is that you know if you for example, want a user to push that red button, right? You can design for that. Okay, you can actually design for that. Right, so you could give them the motivation, give them the ability to do it, and create a trigger, right? And then once you have all these three components all happen at one at the same time, they guess what? People will reliably push that red button, right? More than you you believe it. Okay, so so you say, okay, that sounds easy, right? Create motivation, trigger, and ability, and it's nice. It's like a game of tic tac toe. It's a game, right? So easy, right? But games are actually not easy, all right? Think about World of Warcraft. It's a very, very complex game, okay? Now, uh, in fact, it's not it's so difficult that you know uh, Gartner, who actually published uh, the hype cycle, who identified gamification as an emerging technology in 2011, the very, very next year, 2012, they actually published another report that not many people know about, okay? But that 80% of the currently gamified app will fail, okay? So. Um, Due to poor design, the key is actually what do you do to design it right so they don't fail. Okay, so just um, as an example, let's see how 
difficult you know, this is, right? For example, loyalty programs. I'm sure a lot of you have uh, participated in some loyalty program, whether it's frequent flyer or hotel loyalty program, right? How many of you actually have a, okay, just let me ask you guys. Do you participate in any like, uh, travel-based loyalty program, right? Raise your hand if you do. If you're a part of a hotel or, or frequent flyer, right? Raise your hand, okay? So this is, okay, a lot of you probably do, okay? Typically, I mean, this is actually a survey from a, 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 actually two different conferences together, a sample size of a 1,273, right? So it's actually a pretty substantial size. Pretty much everybody have it, right? Only 2% of people don't, okay? So let, for those people who have raised your hand before, let me ask you another question. Do you have more than one of these programs? Guess what? A lot of people still raise their hand, right? So, and this is exactly what we're seeing as well. This is, again, the same uh, sample that I have, right? So between this and this, what is it actually telling you? Yeah, you're not loyal. Only like 10% only of the people are truly loyal because if you have more than one, you're loyal to neither. You're loyal to none. Right? So loyalty programs are not really driving loyalty, right? So what is it actually doing, right? It's not actually working, right? So if you actually look at why gamification fail, I mean, um, typically it kind of scatter all the place, okay? And if you actually look at it uh, more carefully, there is a pattern, right? The, the short-term problem tend to work pretty well, and the long-term one, they don't work very well. They, they tend to, I mean, it's not that they don't work at all, so it's more like a, a sideways thumb, okay? So, um, yeah, sideways thumb. It's not a thumb down, sideways, okay? So, yeah. So, so what do I mean by long-term and short-term? Basically, every problem that you're trying to gamify, every, every behavior they're trying to gamify have what we call an effective time scale, okay? So just let me give you some examples. So effective time scale basically go from really, really short to really long, right? So these are short means almost immediate, like long as going to like years or maybe, you know, several years, many years, right? So one example of, you know, the... Uh, uh, things that you could use gamification to drive is you could drive social media participation in the conference. For example, gamification Europe, right? A lot of you are tweeting photos and, and quotes from speakers, right? right? You could gamify that, right? But typically, how long does a, uh, a conference typically last? Yeah, two days, right? For gamification Europe, right? Two days, right? But typically, less than a week, right? And a few days, right? So that's the effective time scale, okay? You can also use gamification to drive employee onboarding. You can onboard employee, right? When you actually hire an employee, you have to make them go through all the training and watch all the video, make sure that they know what's a compliance way of doing things, right? So typically, how long does it take to onboard employee? It's probably on the order of a few weeks to a month, right? Depending on how complex your product is, right? So these are, so this is essentially the, the the time scale that you're working on, right? And if you, have, you know, you can also use gamification to drive marketing engagement with your marketing campaign, but marketing campaign typically lasts on the order of a few months, right? So and that's the time scale you're working on, right? So now let's take a look at a little bit longer time scale. For example, community co-creation, right? Community co-creation is actually pretty hard because that typically takes anywhere from year to maybe several year to several year, right? So so that's a time scale you're working on. So these are the, and, and loyalty, for example, right? Loyalty, by definition, <laughs> is a concept of that, you, you know, it's very long term, right? You can't be loyal to a brand when you only use them for, you know, six months, right? That's, that's not, it's hardly loyal, right? I mean, you, I mean, and same as a company, right? You can't be loyal to a company when you work there for only, like, you know, a month, right? So, so that's, that's not loyal, right? Loyalty inherently means long term, right? So it means actually you have to, your behavior have to exhibit over a long periods of time, right? For being loyal, right? So what I, so in fact, so there's actually a lot of different uh, behavior that we we want to drive in a, you know in a company. That's actually very very hard, and these are long typically long term problems, right? In fact, you know, so if you actually look at it, you know, so any, things that are kind of on the left side are things that work pretty well, okay? And the things that are work on the right side, so some the boundary is kind of fuzzy. It's typically somewhere between half a year to a year, okay, Some, and, and maybe it's slightly longer. So the boundaries are kind of fuzzy, right? Um, so if I actually look at, you know, there are, there are actually many other behavior in our life that we can actually gamify as well, okay? Those are long-term behavior, and those are pretty hard, okay? So in theory, you just have to know what outcome you want to drive with gamification, right? And then you can gamify them, and people will do those behavior that you want, right? But in practice, this is actually not enough, okay? So in this case, 
if I, if I know I want to drive conference participation, right? Is that enough? Is that enough? If I want to drive market engagement with my marketing campaign, is that enough? In practice, it's actually not enough. Why? Why do you think that's the case? Because an outcome, whether it's a business outcome or a life outcome, typically involves a multitude of human behavior. It's actually involved many, many human behavior. Okay? It's not just one behavior that means you have participated in a conference uh, social media uh, engagement, right? Or engaged with a marketing campaign. It's not one thing. It's many things you have to do, right? So what are those things? If we look at these five examples that I gave, okay? So, for example, participating in a conference, right? What does it involve? What, is, what does it mean to uh, have conf a good kind of social media, good, good, good participation in a conference? It involves a lot of behavior, not just one behavior, right? In, for example, arrive at the venue on time, attend keynotes, live tweet presentations, share photos, join breakout sessions, meet partners, study vendor offering, blah, blah, blah. All that is, it means all, that, all those behavior constitute conference participation, okay? What about onboarding an employee? And onboarding an employee is not one behavior. It's actually many, many different behavior, okay? So what does it involve? For example, attending employee training, get IT and computing access, watch training video, study compliance and regulation, meet with your buddy and mentor regularly, right? And learn to use uh, supporting software, understand workflow and process. All those are part of you know, being uh, onboarding, uh, onboarding employee well, okay? What about marketing campaign? Think about that, okay? Engagement with your marketing campaign. What, is that, what does that involve? Well, watch a campaign video, like a video, share a video, download a white paper, right? And sign up for email promotion. Talk to a rep to learn more, right? Visit the product page, right? Test drive a product. Right? All this involve, all this behavior, all this is actually the granular behavior that you need to actually drive, right? What? Well, sure. I think that's, uh, that's, that's at the end of the, of the marketing campaign. Typically, you want to do that, right? So, yeah, you, that could, as, that's what that three dots mean. Right? It means dot, 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 okay? I can't possibly list all the behavior there, right? Okay? So, how about community co creation? Well, it certainly involves you to register to join the community. Come back and visit the community regularly, ask questions, answer questions, participate in trending discussion, give kudos to this discussion that you like, right? submit ideas, and vote for ideas that you might be interested in. Right? So all of these are constitute community co-creation. What about loyalty? What about loyalty? Well, so continuing doing business with the brand, right? And then Re refer other people to the brand, share brand experience on social media, defend the brand when you have you know, irrational people who attack the brand, right? So, yeah. turn down more attractive offers, right? Now, that's pretty hard, right? So, right? So, respond to survey, participate in focus group, all, all that in means loyal to a brand or a company, okay? So, in theory, you just have to know that, okay, I want to drive loyalty. I just want to drive marketing engagement uh, or onboard employee. In, th in practice, it's not enough. You have to know all the behavior that goes into that, okay? So, in fact, you need to know them specifically, um, specific enough so that you can actually measure them, okay? So, for example, in this case of a conference participation, you have to, you know, arrive on time is a one-time event so that you can measure, right? If you arrive on time, you can check in and, all you, and you're done, right? So, attend keynote. How many keynote? Three, right? You could say, you know, share photo. How many photo? Ten, right? So you have to be specific. Uh, all this, I'm, I'm just going to go through this very quickly in the interest of time. Okay? So uh, basically, you have to be very, very specific. Okay? And yeah, so this one is interesting, right? So re loyalty to a, to a company or brand, right? Repeat business with brand over five years, right? That means loyal, right? If you're anything less than that, you, you're not really that loyal. Okay? So, so you have to be <laughs> very, very specific about what you're trying to measure, what you're trying to get out, right? Refer one friend per year, right, to the brand. Okay, so this, all of this is actually required in practice to implement a successful gamification. Otherwise, you're just talking theory. Okay? All right, so tenant number one is understand all the behavior that you want to drive in granular detail. Okay? So basically, now we are come to the fun part. Okay? So this is the exercise that you're going to do. You are going to get, not 15 minutes, but uh, how many? How, how many minutes do you guys need? 12 minutes, okay? 
Okay, the exercise is that. I hope it's not running for two miles. Yeah. Basically, pick a problem of your choice, okay? Whatever behavior that you want to drive in your company or in project that you might be interested in doing, right? And then come up with all the behavior that you want to drive, right? You want to, you want to drive some outcome, right? Some, in some project, some business stakeholder is going to say, oh, I want, to, I want engagement with my, my brand, my website, right? You have to come up with all the list of all the behavior that you want to drive, right? In order to achieve this engagement with the website. What does it mean to engage with the website? Right? You have to understand all those and be specific about it. Okay? So in the next 12 minutes, this thing is going to count down. Okay? I'm going to start. So there's paper on the table. So come up uh, with uh, a behavior and then after, uh, come up with an outcome and then all the granular behavior that's necessary to drive that, that outcome. As a team. Okay, so uh, you guys can discuss among the table to see, you know, what would be an interesting problem, okay? And then uh, agree upon uh, one problem to do in the table, okay? All right. Tell us what is the business outcome that you're trying to drive, and what are all the behavior, uh, granular behavior that goes into it. Okay, yeah, you guys don't have to come up. You could just uh, use the table. And is this mic work? Does this mic work? Okay. So, yeah. So you can use. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so we started with a fairly vague um, idea of loyalty to a shop that sells everything. Uh, and then we got to specifics. Uh, um, increased Remember, revenue the per clock person. is ticking. You got two minutes. Increased revenue per person by 25%. Recommended shopping with the company once per month. Um, all customers need to register with uh, our company. Um, uh, after that, um, uh, we want positive product reviews. Uh, we didn't put a metric uh, beside that yet. Um, we want them to link to our website. Uh, we want to um, have uh, repeat business. Uh, yeah, it's starting to get kind of vague as we move okay. down. You see how hard it gets hard, right? Yeah. So it gets pretty difficult. You have to be very specific, right? So when you say positive review, right? Yeah. So how do you measure that? Right, so that's like you know how many positive review, right? So you can actually come up with a number, right? And link to your website, that's easy. You could use a back tracker, right? So, so you could. So those are things that you have to start thinking about when you trying to implement any kind of gamification program. You have to understand the granular behavior that you're trying to drive. Okay, every behavior that you're trying to drive, right? Gamification is best when you can actually have this uh, behavior in very granular and very specific. They and. That actually leads us to um, the next part of the uh, presentation, which uh, I will talk about just briefly. So actually, um, so most people who are gamification practitioners are usually come from two different backgrounds. Right? Some of them are probably game designers or user interactive designer, UX designer, right? UI designer. And some of them are actually come from behavior science background. So they're either psychologists, behavior economists, right? So um, the strange thing is that I'm actually neither of them, okay? <laughs> so, uh, so I actually stumbled upon gamification accidentally, okay? And I, I basically, I'm a data scientist. I'm a data guy, okay? I use data to measure people's behavior, trying to understand people's behavior, understand so well that we can actually predict what they're going to do, okay? We build models to predict user behavior. But then there's roots. once you're able to predict user behavior, something really, really interesting happens. It's because now you can see that is it actually are those people going to go in the trajectory that you want them to go, right? Because you know what they're going to do, right? Are they going where you want them to go, right? So if they're not, can you actually change them? Can you sway them back towards uh, the behavior that the desirable behavior that you want, right? So. Um, so that's actually how I come into gamification, because gamification is really good at that, changing behavior, right? swaying behavior back to the behavior that you want them to behave. Right? So that's how. Uh, so basically, in theory, you, know, you use behavior science, psychology, you know, design uh, to, de uh, 
to design these behavior drivers, right? So for example, motivation, right? So octalysis, you've seen many, many ex uh, examples of, of uh, use of octalysis in this uh, workshop already. You heard people talk about the hook model, right? The, the, all these different models, right? So you use this, this uh, uh, I would say, psychological construct or behavior science or design principles to design a driver for this behavior, right? But in reality, in gamification, uh, in practice, it really all comes down to measurement, okay? To me, gamification is, is, you know, I look at it from a different lens, because I'm a data guy, okay? So basically, the, the, the way I look at it, the fundamentals of why gamification work is really old. It's like, you know, hundreds of years old, right? And the front-end technology, the interactive platform, is, is fairly new, okay? So they're relatively much newer, right? So these are the scalable interactive platform. They could be social, mobile, software, wearables, whatever you name it, right? But the back-end technology is even newer, right? Basically, it's the big data analytics uh, platforms, okay? So these are the uh, technology that allow you to capture people's behavior, right? I measure them and capture them, right? And do processing and store them, right? Basically, the, these three things is what made gamification possible, right? So gamification is certainly related to game design, but it's actually more related to a discipline called biofeedback. Anybody know who heard of biofeedback? Okay, what is biofeedback? Okay. Yes. Yep. Basically, biofeedback is actually used in health science for the longest time. Okay. Is visualizing how your body works in order to control it and make it work better. That's all it is, right? You could actually, if you could actually look at your heart rate, right? You can actually see how your heartbeat changes from, you know, 60 second, uh, 60 beats a, a minute to 65 beats a minute. Maybe you should calm down, right? Maybe. So you can, it's looking at using data to see how your body works to, uh, to change your body's function, right? So you, you, you know, okay, I'm, be, I'm mindfulness, right? It's, I should be calm. I should, be, I should not be uh, so feisty and nervous, right? I, maybe my heartbeat is, is, is uh, getting too high, okay? So these are examples of biofeedback, right? So I'm going to go through this really quickly. It's a psychology component, very, very old, right? I mean, anything from Marslow to Skinner, right? These are really, really old principles, right? If you want newer stuff, right, fog, right, uh, you heard uh, near Yao's principle, right, the hook model, right? And then interactive platform, you guys have engineers who you work with, right? They will build it, right? So, I mean, I built it myself too, but, uh, you know, um, but anyway. So, you don't have to know too much there, but you just have to know the specification, right? That's why the, the, those behavior that you just wrote down is so important, okay? Uh, and then the big data behind it, okay? And finally, you end up with some app that's gamified, okay? So now let's actually peel back this, uh, look at this kind of uh, uh, a, a little more detail, right? Gamification really is a big data discipline, right? It requires a lot of data for feedback and reinforcement, right? You know, in order to reward somebody's behavior, you have to measure that behavior accurately, right? How are you going to know what he actually did and reward him fairly if you don't, if you don't measure accurately, right? So now... When you actually use those data to drive a behavior, right, then people will naturally exhibit those behavior more, right? So that actually generates more data because every behavior now can be tracked, right? And those behavior can be analyzed to, so it understands people's motivation and all this stuff. So it actually becomes this big loop all centered around data, behavior data, right? So now, if you actually look at uh, uh, this, this, what I call the behavior feedback loop, okay? In a little more detail, it really com consists of four different components, okay? The four components are basically, the, you have the front end, the apps that people use and, and people see, and the back end, you have the data, uh, big data systems, right? So the front end, basically, the, the first component is the user behavior. These are the user who actually exhibit the behavior doing the things that you just jot down on your paper, okay? And these behavior are tracked. So once they, they, they're tracked, they become behavior data, right? And once they analyze it, then you actually know what people actually did, right? And then, uh, then you feed these behavior data into a rules engine. The rules engine is basically something like a, a, a you know, it could be very simple, could be a threshold, right? When you uh, stay at a certain hotel for five nights, then you get a certain status. When you stay 10 nights, you get a different status. When you fly 50,000 miles, you get silver. When you get 100,000 miles, you get you know, a different status, right? So these are essentially the rules engine, right? The rules engine then basically triggers a feedback mechanism when the rules in that in the rules engines are, when, uh, are met, the conditions of the rules are met, okay? So when your behavior meets the condition, 
then it triggers a feedback, right? And the feedback mechanism then delivers the feedback to drive the user behavior. That's how it works, okay? So really, gamification is just a data feedback loop. It's really what it is, okay? So if you look at, if you, if you talk to people who don't have a lot of experience in gamification, when you mention the word gamification, what's the first thing that comes to people's mind? It's basically this, right? The feedback mechanism. That's only one component of the system, right? What people often miss is these two systems, right, which is actually very, very important, right? And when you actually look at a whole gamifica holistic gamification platform, okay, it's really these three components together, okay? You don't control the last the user behavior, but you know that in a feedback loop, right, where you control, where you have full control of all the other components except the last one, right, you can influence that component very, very reliably, okay? So if you could control these three components very reliably, you could influence the user behavior very, very reliably, okay? That's what it is, okay? So, okay, so this is just what I said. The industry basically focused in here, right? They fo and initially, industry only focused in here. I think now, you know, very quickly, you know, the industry got smarter, right? They know they had to understand user behavior. They started to focus on a little bit on the rule, but what they often miss is all the data component. Right? All these uh, stuff that involve data analytics, they miss almost completely, okay? So some people say that gamification doesn't work, right? It doesn't drive results. Well, I mean, you miss a whole big component of it, okay? That's no wonder it's not working, right? So, okay. So what kind of behavior can... Uh, Gamification drive. What is what kind of behavior can gamification drive? It really is two things, all right? Any behavior that you can measure and track accurately, okay? And feedback to the user reliably and effectively. Okay? So if you want to measure how narcissistic a person is, right? You can actually use this measure, right? <laughs> Number, right? Okay. You can read it, okay? So I'm not gonna anyway. Number of uh, selfies per hour, right? <laughs> selfies per hour, right? So, so, so if you look at these two components, right? Being able to measure and track accurately, what does that involve? That involves actually data science, right? You have to know what to measure, right? Technology help you track these behavior at large scale, right? And feeding back to the user reliably is, reliability is achieved by technology, right? But effectiveness is actually understanding the user behavior. You have to understand the psychology, right? What people respond to well, what people don't respond to well, when do you trigger them, right? And so all this is involved, okay? So not tenant number two is that you cannot change the behavior that you don't measure, okay? You cannot change the behavior that you don't measure. So the next uh, exercise basically is a continuation of what you have started earlier, but now you're going to get only 10 minutes, okay? So um, it gets shorter and shorter, okay? So now, all the behavior that you jot down before, right? If you have not come down to a specific uh, uh, example, so let's use table six, right? We talk about having positive review, right? How are you going to measure that? How are you going to measure positive review? Okay, you, you don't have a number yet, right? Let's say we're going to say have 10 positive review per month, okay? Is that too much or too little? 10? Sounds good? Right? Sounds good? Okay. So how do you measure that? Yeah. How do you know that? How do you know that review is actually positive? Right? Huh? How, how do you measure? Okay. I mean, it's, it's easy to measure the number of review, right? But how do you measure the number of positive review? Yes. Okay. Okay. So there are companies who does that, but the, the key is that is they have to do some sentiment analysis, right? Sentiment analysis is a is an analytics service that other company uh, would. Oops, I. Okay, all right, all right. No, no, okay, ten minutes. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you a, a little kind of guideline so you, you guys do the right exercise. So basically, there are company who actually provide these service, right? They will actually, uh, you give them a text, they will tell you is it positive or negative. They will actually give you, you know, positive, this is called sentiment analysis, right? So how do you measure it? You don't have to know how, but you just have to know that it can be measured, right? So you could say, you could, so, so for all the behavior that you have written down, you have to, every one of them, you have to, you have to, you have to tell me how you're gonna measure it, whether it is you develop some 
some kind of a mobile device, some kind of app that you can measure it, or you have third-party vendor who does sentiment analysis to help you measure that, right? So that's the specificity I, I need for the next set of exercise, okay? So you have 10 minutes. Start. So, random number generator again. No, I'm going to regenerate this number, okay? So, oh, we don't have eight. All right. Sorry, originally we counted eight table, but we, we uh, eliminated that table, so I had to change the range. So, um, okay. Oh, <laughs> six again. Wait, all right, should we, should we? Have some give somebody else a chance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let, let's let's do it one more time, okay? Let's give it one more time. Okay. <laughs> it really likes sex. Oh my god. I didn't I didn't do this. <laughs> it's truly random. All right, table two. Two oh right there. Okay, table two. Excellent. So Tell us what is the business, so you have to go all the way from the beginning, okay? So tell us the business outcome that you're trying to drive and all the behavior that goes into that and how you're going to measure that, okay? So go ahead. Uh, okay, so basically you get two minutes. Okay, so uh, I didn't hear anything specific. How many? Uh, okay, yeah, good, it's good, getting good. there. Okay. Uh, create social media buzz and uh, user uh, having user create communities. So uh, the metric system we're going to use, uh, we're going to measure the number of clicks, signups, and uh, maybe information requests on our platforms. Uh, and we want it to be at least 100 a week. Okay, 100 uh, clicks a week. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to be measuring via Google Analytics, for example. Excellent. Um, then we're going to monitor the number of posts. So we want at least 10 per week. Again, okay. Google Analytics for it. Uh, the sales numbers, uh, that should be around five per week. Uh, so we are going to measure it with the internal sales data and uh, okay. invoices, maybe. Yep. Uh, number of ratings per week. Uh, so it should be on a scale from one to five above three to be a positive rating. And uh, w we would be also using an external tool for uh, sentiment measuring for the, for the reviews. Mm -hmm. um, we would be uh, surveying also uh, the users to, to check uh, where did they uh, learn for about our product. Okay. Uh, we want to have uh, one ambassador, one new ambassador of the product every two weeks. Um, we want to. Thumbs up. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just had one other point. Sorry. All right, one other point. Finish your point. So, and for the communities, we want at least one commu new community a month, and we are going to use analytics and uh, community manager to get data about. The community. Community manager. Okay. So it's going to be an actual kind of human that's going to measure that, right? Okay. Not a robot, no. Yep. So this is all very good. Okay. So you guys start to get the idea, right? So you, so the point of this exercise is that a lot of times gamification, we all know it requires data. And the data actually very often come from many different places, right? So you know, that we hear that we need to get it from Google Analytics. For the sales data, you need to get it from the sales, uh, you know, CRM system, right? Something like you need integration. It's not that simple, right? It's not just a theory talk that oh, we have all the data, it's all good, it's going to all come, right? 
you're going to talk to the department. The department may not give you the data. <laughs> you may not have access, right? You may not. So sales data is very sensitive, right? So how are you, they going to question that? What are you going to use that data for, right? So all that is the messiness of implementing successful gamification, all right? So, all right. So, um, so now you have all the behavior, right? Um, we know that, you know, I'm sure all of you have heard of this concept of flow, right? Everybody have heard of this, right? It's this... Uh, kind of in the zone feeling that you are, you know, and you, uh, it's a, basically Csikszentmihalyi not only quantify this uh, state of flow, right, that where you, you, where you kind of forget about everything, right, you forget about the fact that you're hungry, you're tired, you just keep doing it, right, and you also identify the condition that's necessary to go in that, that, that state, and that's basically the challenge that you face, I have to match your skill, right, if it's too easy, right, if the challenge that you face is too easy compared to your skill, then you get bored, right, if it's, too challenging, but you know, and you don't have enough skill, you get you get worried, you get anxious, right? You, you, you because you can't do it, right? So flow is this fine line, right? It's a fine line between certainty and uncertainty. Do you think people like certainty? Yes. Only certainty? Yes. <laughs> no, right? People, yeah, people like certainty, right? We like to be in the control state, but we also we hate we don't like to be in the the, the kind of uh, the boredom state either, right? So we also we also like to be a little challenged too, right? If it's if we have full control, right? We have everything in control. We could do it, do this task with our eyes closed. Basically, you get bored, right? So people like certainty, and people also like uncertainty, right? It's it's this really really fine line, right? What people often forget is that people's skill, right? The skill, ability, axis on the on the bottom here, right? It changes for people, right? Because why? Why do you think that changes? We yeah, we learn, right? By doing things over, over time, we learn, we get better at what we do, so we get more acquire, we acquire more skill, right? So even though we may be in the state of flow right now, eventually we get into this boredom state because, you know, we get better at what we do, right? So how do you fix that problem? Raise a, raise a challenge, right? So raise a challenge. You, so in reality, in theory, okay, very, very easy, right? Give them a more difficult task. In reality, that's not so simple, right? Typically, you know, you're a boss. If you did a, if you did a good job, you, he may say, okay, now do the same thing again, right? Then that's going to be still boring, right? And on the other hand, your boss may say, hey, you know what? Let's just scale this, you know, to the five neighboring country, right? Then you're going to say, holy crap. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. I don't even speak their language. <laughs> like, like, so, right? a yeah, that's a challenge. It's a, bit, it's a bit too hard there, right? So now, if it's a little bit too hard, it's okay, right? Because now you have to, you have to acquire a little bit more skill, right? So your, shallow, your learning curve will be pretty shallow, and you acquire skill, you go back to this state of flow. But very often, you know, your boss may say, hey, you know what? We've got to scale this entire world. We're going to dominate the entire world. We're going to take over the world, right? And you're going to say, Holy sh! I'm not gonna say that word, but <laughs> right. So uh, that's a case when it's way too hard. Okay, when it's way too hard, you have a steep learning curve and you don't get back into flow until you learn all this skill, and it's gonna take you a long time, right? So that's why people don't very often experience the state of flow, but it's a pleasurable uh, feeling when we actually are in that state, right? So there is a industry that has mastered getting people into flow, and that's everybody here knows, right? The gaming industry, right? And how do you think they do it? How do you think they do it? Huh? Data? Data? Analytic, right? Well, I mean, yeah, good games are designed to maximize flow, but how do you think they actually do it? What do you think they, they what do you think the okay, games are designed by game designers, right? So what do game designers do to make sure that people actually stay in this flow zone? I hear narrative, I hear tests, I hear what what else? Okay, all of these are, are very important. Okay, these are very, but the most critical component is 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 just this, right? Right? You zigzag along this flow zone, right? So think about what are you actually doing, right? What does a game designer have to do to make sure that you actually stay in this flow zone? Okay, okay, that that that, that is definitely important. You do have to measure it, but the the key thing is is this, right? The game designer control the level of difficulty in a very specific way. 
right, in a very specific way. Right? The specific way is this. Basically, that every next step that the player takes is a, it's a baby step relative to the ability they already acquire. OK? That's the key. All right? So what does that mean? So take, for example, this step. Let's say this is the next step. OK? This is a big step. It's a very difficult step, right? But relative to the skill that the player has already acquired, which is here, this is a baby step. Can you see? Can you see something? This is, is a difficult step. How can something be easy and hard at the same time? This is how it can be easy and hard at the same time, OK? So if this example is not um, illustrative enough, I'm going to give you another example. So this is Angry Bird level 100. Okay, if you had not played Angry Bird level one to level ninety nine, this would be impossible for you, right? It's very hard. Right? How are you gonna like? You have three shots. How are you gonna knock down all these things, right? It's very very difficult, very difficult step. But on the other hand, if you have played Angry Bird level one to level ninety nine, this level would look very easy. All of a sudden, look very easy. Why? Because when you play level 1 to level 99 of Angry Bird, real, right? You learn how to play. You learn how the physics of it works. You say, you say, I don't have to knock everything down. I have to knock this one, and this will trickle. The other ones will fall, right? You learn how it works. You learn how to play, right? You, you acquire skill, right? That's how you are able to, you know, even though this is a very difficult step, diff, di very difficult level, right, you can actually feel achieve it because from the uh, skill you already acquire by playing level 1 to level 99, OK? So this is how you get something. That's difficult, but easy and achievable at the same time, OK? All right. So in theory, right, we want to keep people in, in this uh, flow zone. But in practice, how do you actually do it? How do you actually do it? You as I said before, you control the level of difficulty, right? So, so when you actually uh, think of a behavior that you want to drive, right? Typically, there's a lot of sometimes repetition, right? For example, we heard before that you want to drive 100 clicks, right? So, but it all starts with one, right? So, how, but, you know, sometimes uh, if it's a behavior that takes too long, people will fall off, right? So in the middle, you have to basically divide them into different levels, okay? So the leveling structure is actually very important, right, when you're designing a gamification, right? So typically, uh, there are what we call, uh, there's actually two very popular scheme, okay, of this leveling structure. One is what we call linear progression. It's also called arithmetic uh, progression, right? These are basically the level criterion is basically a fixed difference, right? 10, 20, 30, 40. So every level, it's a, it's, it's a difference is the same, okay? This is what we call the uh, linear progression. And uh, a lot of, I would say, loyalty program actually use this. For example, United Airlines uses this, right? Basically, you know, you basically have to get, you know, uh, from silver to gold to platinum to 1K. The difference is 25,000 uh, 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 PQM, which is a pre-qualified uh, mile, right? So that's basically every level is different. Right? From 50 to, from the gold to platinum is again another 25,000 mile, right? Okay. So these are very common. So the, another one is actually uh, 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 also very used, very common, is what we call the exponential progression. Sometimes it's also called a geometric progression. Okay? So here, it's not that the, the difference is a, is a fix. Here, the ratio is fixed. Okay? So from 10 to 20 right, is twice. Right? From 20 to 40 is twice. From 40 to 80 is twice again. Okay? So the ratio is fixed between every level. Right? Okay. So now, uh, so actually a lot of, uh, I would say, out-of-the-box game software apps use this type of progression, OK? So the, the, the problem is that neither of these are optimal at driving the behavior that you want, OK? Why? Because with linear progression, yeah, it's too easy. Why? Because to get the next step, to get to the next level, you just tell the user, you just have to do the same thing, right? Just do the same thing you did before, you get the next level. No challenge, right? So, right? How about this one? This is, yeah, eventually it gets too difficult, right? Initially, it can be pretty easy, right? But eventually, at some point, it becomes too difficult because that's how exponential work, right? Anybody uh, seen, um, uh, damn, I've got a movie now. Um, so there's this uh, saying that, you know, um, I, I'll, 
forget it. I, I forgot the name. I, I forgot the name of that movie. <laughs> no, it slipped my mind. Okay. So basically, at some point, right, it becomes too difficult, right? If you, if there's a people are saying that if there's a a a, a, a glass uh, that's uh, containing a bacteria or something that divide, you know, into two deep bacteria every minute, right? And it takes a a whole day to fill up the cup, right? Basically, the very last minute is only half full. Right? And then the last minute, it will be so basically for a lot of time, you, you almost see nothing. Right? And then the very last minute, it becomes, it, it, it explodes. Right? Okay. So that's the problem with using this exponential kind of uh, progression. Okay. So neither of these are, are good enough. Right? Think, think about this. Why is exponential not good enough? Right? So would you, uh, every time, let's just say, let's say if this is like uh, your work, right? Are you willing to work double? the time that you spend at work, right, for the, your next promotion. Every promotion you get, you have to work double. Do you think that's sustainable? Impossible, right? Impossible, right? It's, it's, so that, but the, people are still using this, right? And that's why this, these, these uh, two progressions are actually not uh, very good, right? So how do we get these, uh, the, the principle that I, I said earlier, that every step that the player takes, Right, it's a baby step relative to the skill they already acquired. How do we get that? What kind of progression should that be? Okay, that, that, but what, what does that mean? What does that actually mean? Okay. 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 So there's actually a. a a, a lot of science that, that goes behind that. So I, I want to give you a chance to, to say what, you, what you're proposing. So I was saying it's like a, an equation where you have two variables. Mm -hmm. Y is for skill. Y have one is for skill. So that's the variable. Okay. So two is the variable Y. Okay. So you have it's basically two variables, right? So in fact, it, it does in, in involve two variables. But uh, it's not that simple. What you say, Y equals MX plus B, that's actually linear. Yeah. That's actually linear. OK? That's actually a line. That's, actually, that's the equation for a line. Okay? So it turns out the optimal, kind of near optimal progression is what we call linear increment. Okay? So this is actually very important here. Okay? So now linear increment, it means that you, know, you look at the, what is the pattern here? Like 10, 20, 40, 70, 110, 160. What is the, what is the pattern here? It's not Fibonacci. It's the last one. Exactly. Okay? So it's the increment. Is linear, okay? The, the increment from 10 to 20 is 10, from 20 to 40 is 20, from 40 to 70 is 30, right? So basically, the increment is linear. It's just like linear, okay? So that's why it's called linear increment, okay? So if you have this kind of scale, basically, you could try it, test it, right? Every next step is a big step, but it will be a baby step relative to the skill you acquire. But at the beginning, it, 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 it's not like, not at the beginning, it, it's really, uh, things are so easy, it doesn't really matter anyway, okay? What do you mean by raising the experience? Yep. No, you don't. Yeah, that's right. You should get one point, but you have to do more. You say, you, instead of doing one, one click, you have to do 20 click. Right? OK. So now, so this is actually what we call near optimal uh, uh, progression. OK? So the linear uh, increment uh, progression actually has a formula. OK? And that formula is actually you have to determine two things. You have to determine one is the criteria to achieve the top level, okay? And then the two thing, the second thing you need is not how many level do you want to have, okay? So once you have, so how do you determine the top, uh, the criteria to achieve the top level? So if you actually look back at the, say this example with United, um, right? The top level is a uh, hundred thousand mile, right? How do you come up with that? Basically, you look at your top performing user, right? So for example, the example that you said that you want a 100 click, right? Take a look at what, how fast are your top user clicking, right? Do, do they have 100 click a, a week, or, or, or are, are, they, are, they, are they doing 500 clicks a week, right? Maybe 100 is too little, right? So look at the top guy, OK? And then, uh, and then you could de determine how long do you want them to get there. And then that would tell you what should the top level be, right? OK? So from that. From the top 
per top user's performance, you're able to get the, the criteria to get to the top level, right? And then you all, you can, the next thing you have to ask yourself is, how frequent do you want this uh, feedback to be? Do you want this to actually uh, drive feedback to the user? Right? Do you want this feedback to be every, say, like, uh, say if you want, um, say, uh, you say 10 posts a week, right? Was that? Yes. OK, 10 posts a week. So a year, how many posts do you should have? 520, right? So 520 posts per year, right? So that's the one you want, right? So, so if your top user can, achieve, can like contribute 520 posts a year, right? That should be the top level, right? But you have to think about, I don't want to just give him something after a year, right? I want to give him something along the year. How, how many should I give that to them, right? Should I give him 10 or should I give him 12 or so? So that's the number of level that you want, okay? So you have to think about that. So um, let's do one example, OK? So and then the next one exercise, you would do that for the one of the behavior that you have chosen, OK? No? No. You guys can handle this, right? You guys are the hero. There you go. So the formula of a near optimal leveling criteria is that you is this. Basically, C of n is equal to d, which is uh, a, a number that you have to solve for, right? And then uh, divided by 2, and then n times n squared. That was it, OK? All right. It's not that difficult, OK? Trust me, OK? So let's use this formula to fix United's uh, uh, kind of leveling criteria, OK? Basically, the top is, we know that, right? The top is C is. 100,000 mile, right? We know that, right? We, we've seen that right here, right? And let's say, you know, I want to keep it the same. But I, have, I have four level, right? So basically, n will be four, right? OK, now you have this. So basically, you have to solve for d, OK? So how do you solve for d? Solve for d. Well, yeah, multiply both sides by 2 and then divide it by n plus n squared, right? So basically, d is equal to? 2 times c, right, divided by n times n square, right? Easy. Just multiplication and division, right? Arithmetic, grade school stuff, right? OK, so now, OK, so what is c? c, as, as I said, 100,000, right? So 2 times 100,000, right? How many level? 4. 4 plus 4 square is 4 plus 16 is 20, right? So basically, you got 200,000. You know, multiply it out, adding this, you got d equals 10,000. This is the leveling, uh, essentially, division, what we call it, d, OK? So now, you can use this to compute the optimal leveling for united. Now you have d, right? You have d, right? So basically, you, say, you plug it into this formula. d is equal to 10,000, which I've just shown you how to solve for, OK? And you divide it by 2, right? And then you basically. Uh, put it in this formula, right? This formula right here, right? So for the first level, what should it be? 10, yeah, right? So 10,000 divided by 2 is 5,000, right? Plus n is 1, and 1 squared is also 1, right? So it's 2. So basically, you get 10k. The next level, level 2 is what? OK, so 5,000 plus, right? n is 2 now, right? And 2 squared is 4, right? So now you get 30k. Right? 60,000. What's the last one? It's the same, right? Because you, you choose it to be the same, right? OK? So that's how you do, how you fix the United's um, uh, leveling structure. So keep in mind, what, is it, what does this do, right? It, it, it doesn't change the top level, right? But what does it do to this leveling structure? Yeah, exactly, right? You made it a lot easier to achieve the earlier levels, right? And then it gets harder and harder, basically, to, to earn these uh, benefits from the 1K. You have to work harder and harder, right? And not just do the same thing as before, right? See, this is how you get people not get bored, right? Right now, as I showed you before, most airline loyalty programs are not really driving loyalty anyway. They're only driving loyalty for about less than 10% of the population. People are just collecting points for because they're convenient, right? So, OK. So, in practice, you have to level up in baby steps using the linear increment based on the top player's performance, OK? So now, for the next exercise, you have a, another, um, no, you will get five minutes, OK? 
Okay? So, yes, of course it gets harder every time. So, of all the behavior that you thought of before, you, you have jot, jot down and you have already ways to measure it, right? Pick one that actually have, requires a lot of repetition, okay? And it's, for example, like a hundred, uh, t a 10 posts a week, but for a year, it's going to take 520, 520 posts, right? So something like that, right? So, and then think about what would the top user uh, performance be like, okay? And then you could backtrack, reverse engineer this problem, right? See, so you could, you could essentially pick out what that C is. That C, that the formula that I showed you before, what that C is, right? So basically, in a year, how, ma how many posts can they contribute, right? How many times are they going to visit your website throughout the entire year, right? And then you ask yourself, how many level do you want? Okay, so basically, with that, you can actually create a progression that's actually near optimal. Okay? So, uh, all right, you guys got five minutes to do this. Start. <laughs> Random number generator. OK. So who's going to tell me how they're going to? Five. <laughs> Table five. I think it's over there, right? Table five is over here, I believe. All the way to the corner over there. OK. so. So you got to tell me, uh, table five, are you guys ready? <laughs> are you guys ready? You guys are ready, okay. So in two minutes, you got to tell me what is the behavior that you're trying to drive, okay? And uh, how many of those is it, right? Of, and why do you think the top performers will get to that level, and, and then tell me what the progression will be like, OK? And what do you, how do you use that formula? That D, uh, what's D, and how many level do you have, OK? All right, go. Hello. Good. Excellent. Okay, so we have an onboarding process, and um, we've gone, come down and focused on um, process milestone adherence. Um, and what we've said is that we want st to. We're starting at an ex expected level of fifty percent, and we want to get up to eighty percent, not eighty-five percent. So a little bit more complex for the uh, for things. So we're not sure we calculated right. We'll see in a minute. Yeah. So what we, ba we basically have broken down our improvement from fifty to eighty-five over four quarters. Uh, so we've basically got four increments. Um, and our calculation is that 35 is the improvement, which is how we've calculated from 50 to 85. So C is 35. Um, and to work that through, D then comes out at 3.5. Three point five. Um, and then as we put that back into the formula, um, each of the increments starts at 51.75 is the first quarter rising up to 60.5 in the second quarter, 71, and then 85. Excellent. Is it right? Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody want to take another shot at doing this? No? You guys have fun doing that? Yeah. That was fun, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So in the interest of time, okay, yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Yes, yes. Yep. Yeah, so, so it's best to have your own data. So uh, if you don't, of course, I would say try to do a user study, right? See, and then, and then get a kind of upper bound estimate, right? And then if you can't, yeah, borrow data from industry, yeah. 
Yeah, test, right? But I mean, user study, test, right? So iterate. OK? So, um, so what does this tell us, right? Basically, if you, if now you know how to create a near optimal kind of ladder structure, right? Basically, what does that mean? That means, in theory, if you design the perfect leveling ladder, you shouldn't have to do anything extra, right? Basically, the, you know, whatever the user did, right? You, you will be constantly in the state of flow, right? Right? In theory, right? In theory, you should be constantly in the state of flow. You should be very engaged and doing exactly what the designer wants you to do, right? So, but, um, well, in practice, it's actually not that simple, right? So, I basically created a, a gamification framework called a, a gamification spectrum. You've seen this, uh, some of you who attended some of my uh, talks or uh, at the Gamification World Congress a couple of years ago have seen this, right? Basically, it's a, it's a spectrum where you organize all the different um, uh, uh, tools in a time scale. And this time scale is not the effective time scale that I talked about before. It's actually what we call the feedback time scale. The feedback time scale is how quickly this gamification tool feedback the performing data back to the user or the player, OK? So you can actually get a lot of information from this gamification spectrum. In fact, it's actually patented, OK? Um, you can learn about how to shift from intrins uh, extrinsic motivation to intrinsic motivation and all the stuff that you uh, want to learn about this. But uh, So I won't have time to go into this, right? Because I only have one and a half hour. In fact, my time is up, right? So I want to talk about mission. I want to talk about mission because a lot of people in the industry actually misuse mission. In theory, you could use mission whenever you want, right? OK. But let's see where mission actually fits in this spectrum. Every single tool that you use in gamification fits somewhere in this spectrum based on how quickly did they feedback to the user. OK? So what is a, how, what's the a, what's a feedback time scale of a mission? Well, it's however long it takes the player to complete that mission, right? That's how long it is. Because when you complete a mission, you get a feedback. You get some awards. You get some, a badge or something, right? So that's how long it is. And that can be really short, or it can be really long, right? It, it, it's, it's not like it's, this tool, this mission actually has multiple time scale depending on how you design the mission, right? So basically, you have to look at mission in a different way, right? Mission is basically all these uh, different tools that you have, right, adding a time constraint to it, basically, right? And the constraint usually is time, but it actually doesn't have to be always time, OK? So for example, points. 10 points in the next 12 hours, that becomes a mission. Because you put a time constraint, you put a 12 hour to it, that becomes a, a mission, right? For uh, give, give three kudos in the next 24 hours, right? For badges, you could say, get one badges by the end of the week, right? That becomes a mission, right? And even leaderboard can become a mission, right? Get on the leaderboard by the end of the month, right? Or maybe you say, you know, stay on the leaderboard for two months in a row, right? That could be a mission. So everything, think about this, every one of these tools basically uh, can be turned into a mission by adding some kind of time constraint, right? So I'm not going to go through this. Uh, you could, I will make the slide into a PDF and then give it to Pete um, Vasilis. So he could actually put it on the website so you guys could get this information, okay? So the UI typically is shows you how the resources get consumed, right? And the progression of the user, right? So for example, let's take this one right here, okay? Give three kudos in the next 24 hours, right? So you're basically, your 24 hours, your, your resource constraint, your time constraint, right? So that's going to count down. And you're going to get one kudo, two kudo, uh, three kudo, I just made it. So mission complete, right? Done. OK. So when do you use mission? So this is actually where theory and practice diverge, OK? So in theory, right, this ladder, the more rungs you have and the more closely spaced they are, the more engaging it's going to be. Right? Because basically, think about that flow, right? It's, it's, you know, you're going to zigzag, zigzag, zigzag all the way in, through that flow zone, right? In theory, that's what it is, right? But in practice, what will happen? Too many rungs? Yeah, it's a management headache, right? And also, it's actually kind of confusing for the people, right? Because you don't know what rungs actually, because those rungs, you have to, you, you pre presumably, you have to name them, right? You have to give them some name, some level, right? So if you have, like, say, 100, like, rungs, uh, you, you're not going to name, like, you know, contributor number one, contributor <laughs> number two. Or you're not going to name them, like, such, you're going to name them something 
cooler, right? That actually fits into the narrative. Narrative is actually important, right? Fits into the narrative. For example, if you are in a, a, a military game, right, you may want to have a, a, a rung, a level named like a, a, a marksman or a sharpshooter, right? But people who are not in the military, is a sharpshooter better than a marksman or a marksman better than a sharpshooter, right? And a sniper better than them or what? what? I mean, how, how do I know, right? If you have too many of these rungs, it gets confusing, right? So it's actually very, very, in practice, you can't have too many rungs, right? In fact, and you, you, the rungs cannot be spatially too close together because it's too confusing to people. Right? People don't know which one is better, right? Should I, I, I just had my marksman and you gave me a, a, a sharpshooter? That doesn't sound like it's good, right? That's, I, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm downgraded, right? But in reality, it may not, right? So, so people actually get confused that way, okay? So when you use a mission, right? You use a mission when there's, uh, as player basically progress through this gamification ladder, the rules become more obscure, right? And, and harder to achieve, which it should be, right? I'm almost done, okay? So... So last exercise, okay? So basically, so you want to use mission when there's substantial population of the player gets stuck. Basically, they don't move on to the next level, okay? When they're actually stuck in somewhere, right? So for example, right, you may have a level that require a, a badge that requires 50 points, but most people are stuck at 30 points, right? So they, they're not, they, they get in 30 points and they drop off, they, they leave and they don't want to play anymore, right? So what do you do? You Create a mission. You say, okay, the mission is to get 10 points by the end of the week, and you do this two or three times, basically, then people will get it. People will get on the next rung. Okay? Make sense? Okay? So, a couple more examples, right? For example, you may have a, a producer's medal that will require posting 25 posts, right, and getting 10, Im and 10 images and one video, okay? So, most players may know that they need to, uh, they, they, they post. Uh, 10 images and 25 posts, they, they know how to do, they, know, they did that, they achieved that, but they don't know that they need to post a video, right? They may not know that, right? So basically, you could create a mission. You create a mission and say, okay, now the mission is share a funny video by the end of the week. The minute they share that, that video, the ladder kicks in, right? They will move on the next level because the ladder already is, is structured that way, right? To move on to the next level, right? Another one. A trusted member rank requires a member to register for the community for a year, right? And post 100 messages and receive 10 kudo, right? So people are posting a lot of messages, right? They may not get enough kudo to get this, get, to get this rank. They may have like a few kudos, right? So what can you do? You basically, not lower the ladder, right? You basically create a mission, right? You create a mission and say, it also used to, the, the mission is to give three kudo to your favorite post in the next 24 hour, right? So as people give more kudo, other people will get kudo, right? When they get kudo, they will move on to the next rank. See the point, okay? You don't use mission just for the sake of using mission, right? You use mission to kind of augment the fact that you cannot design the perfect ladder, right? And you, use it, you need to use those missions to drive the behavior that you want to, want to drive with urgency to move them on the next rung of the ladder. So they learn, right? They may not know. In, in, from this couple of examples, you see that sometimes it's that the people just don't know they need, to, they need to do that to get to that level, right? So there's a way to kind of give them a little nudge, right? Give them a little hint, right? What to do to get to the next level, right? And then the ladder will do most of the work, okay? All right, so, um, so tenant number six, right? So you want to use mission when only a subpopulation of players get stagnant and don't move on to the next ladder, next uh, rung. So the last exercise. Okay, four. <laughs> all right, all right. So let me give you like a, I mean, thirty seconds. All right. How, how many? How much time do I have? I have no more time. Yeah, one minute. All right. Sorry. All right. Let 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 let's. All right. So you do this as your homework. Okay. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. So whenever, so the, 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 the mission is, uh, sorry, the, the assignment, the exercise is basically from the exercise that you just created, right? You, ha you have the ladder, you, have, you calculate the optimal progression, right? What is, just imagine that somewhere in the middle, there's some, uh, um, somebody, some population just stuck there. They don't move on to the next ladder, to the next rung, the next level, okay? So what kind of mission can you create? to help them move the next rung, right? Sometimes it requires other people to give them something, right? Sometimes it's, it's to teaching them to, to 
tell them that they need to do something in order to get there, right? To, it's to create the urgency so they need to do it, but not in a direct way. You don't, you don't, you're not telling them that, hey, you know what? You need to post a video to get on the next option, you stupid. Right? You don't do that, right? You, tell them that, but you just give them the mission, right? And when they do it, they naturally they learn, right? Okay, so with that, uh, I am basically done. So, um, and this is the secret code. You guys have gone through this workshop, and uh, you guys are very brave. Because <laughs> this. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah.